Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Justin. I play guitar on songs in Nashville. And Nashville has been enjoying a seven inch blanket of snow uh, for the past few days. And we're supposed to get more tomorrow, which is amazing. My kids love it. Uh, they're probably going to be out of school for the entire week. So, you know, it's like another Christmas break. <laughs> but, you know, They'll probably tack those days on at the end of the year, so I don't know. Uh, we may be one of the only families in town who actually have sleds. Uh, my wife found them for like $3 at this amazing place called Dirt Cheap. <laughs> uh, and I was like, why are you buying those? She goes, if we ever are able to use them, our kids are going to freak out. And they have completely freaked out. They've been going to the same hill for three days, and anytime another family shows up with, like, a trash can lid or something, some makeshift sled, our kids are like, "Try this! It's amazing!" So, they're they're sharing. They're being they're being good dudes. Uh, I want to talk about something um, that I think every creative person, especially musicians, has dealt with and maybe deals with on a daily basis. And that is imposter syndrome. When I first heard that term, I thought, oh man, that's perfect. That's, that's the perfect thing to call this thing that I've been feeling, you know? Um, if you're not familiar, imposter syndrome is where you get into some sort of situation where you are doing something creative. Um, if you're playing music, maybe you are sitting in with a band or rehearsing with a band, or you're maybe you're playing on somebody's record. Imposter syndrome is when you feel like it's a fluke that you've got to where you are, that somehow a mistake was made, and everyone's going to find out that you're not actually that great, or that you only have like one or two things that people really like and then you run out of ideas or something something to that effect. Um, it affects everybody. Uh, I remember seeing this meme about doing what you love for a living and I thought this was so funny. An engineer who I highly respect in town, his name's Reed Shippen, he shared this on Instagram years ago. It, it said, do what you love for a living and you'll never work another day in your life. Except the second half of it, the and you'll never work another day in your life, was crossed out. <laughs> and what was written in its place was, and you'll question everything, and you'll have no boundaries, and you'll obsess over every last detail and wonder if you're actually doing anything worthwhile with your life and all these things. And I was like, oh man, that's right, you know. And over the years, through various times, I've, I've really, honestly, and this is going to sound terrible coming from the position that I've worked myself to, I realize that what I do is a dream for so many people. But I, at times, have envied the people who do something they don't love for work. Because they can leave it at work. You can put in the hours set it down, walk away, and you don't drag any of the internal weird headspace stuff like like imposter syndrome or like wondering if you're actually going to get this call from somebody who said they were going to call you but they've never called you before and it's been a while since they said it and blah, blah, blah. You don't bring any of that home, you know? If you just sort of punch a clock or do something that that doesn't also occupy your thought life even when you're at home, then there, there seems to me from the other side of it, there's, there's freedom in that, you know? Because I know that I've, I've been at times um, testy at home because something went weird at work. And I don't mean like I had a session, it was a bad session or something. I just mean like, I'm looking at the next week and it's not as booked as what I'm used to. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Uh, 
so many so many older guys and like session players that have come before me have have told me they tell all of us you know everybody deals with this and i remember jt cornfloss said uh don't ever look ahead when you're looking at your calendar look back you'll see that you worked and even if you had a light week or a light few days or whatever like you got through it you're here now because everything didn't fall apart then so what are you freaking out about but this is something that is really hard for people to get over and i think that social media has added to the complexity of this issue i remember specifically a really great producer in town he was using me on some demos and I'd drag all my gear over his publishing company and we'd, we'd play tracks and he's like, man, that's great. Thanks so much. And he would start saying things like telling everybody about you, you know, <laughs> like, Oh, cool. All right. Awesome. And he would never call me for a record. And then he just stopped calling altogether. And that really bothered me. It was very early in my career as a session musician. I had been touring for years before that, but I had made a distinct transition to go into recording and staying home and being around my family. And uh, I would think about that all the time. Man, is he ever gonna call? And never happened. Um, another time I worked with a massive producer Somebody bailed at the last minute, and I got the call. And he was freaked out because he was not comfortable with people that he wasn't used to um, in the band. And I remember him saying multiple times on this session, hey, that, that, that's really great, thanks. Yes, we do that, or would you change this, or whatever. And it seemed like he got comfortable producing me as a player, you know, telling me, giving me feedback, telling me what was working, what wasn't. Oh, what was the exact words that he used at the end of the session? He said something like, we're going to work together a lot more. Um, we're, you're we're, you're going to see a lot more of me, something to that effect. And I was like, all right, great. I remember telling some other players that that happened two years later because I never heard back from that guy. <laughs> And uh, one, of, one of the guys I was talking to, we were, we were like on break between sessions or eating lunch or something. And he goes, he goes, oh, when they say that, that's the kiss of death. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, any time a producer or writer or artist tells you something that effusive, like that strongly worded, it never happens. Never happens. And so I've thought about this. And I'll get to the social media thing in a minute. I think that people just tell you what they think you want to hear in the moment. You did amazing. I'm totally going to call you. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever that is. And then it doesn't happen. And it might not happen for any number of reasons. They might have had something scheduled with a different guitar player, and then that person becomes their new number one guy or whatever or the guy that they rely on heavily just ha wasn't um booked and so they never got down to your spot on the list and then they kind of forgot after a couple of years whatever it is it's it's almost always never malicious okay so the social media thing the way this adds to it um this feeling the imposter syndrome thing <laughs> sometimes, and this has happened to everybody, everybody, sometimes you get told this thing, oh, I'm totally calling you, I'm, I'm doing this record with somebody, we definitely want to use you, um, just, I'll, I'll let you know when we get dates sorted out. And then you are scrolling through Instagram between songs on a different session, and you see a post from either that artist or that producer or some other musician and it's the person who told you they were calling you working on the project that they told you they were going to call you for 
and it feels like a gut punch, right? You're like, oh, what did I do? What did he, did he find something out about me that he doesn't like? Did somebody say something? Your mind starts racing, right? And then, you know, that adds to this idea that maybe I don't actually belong where I am and in the circles that I've been in. Maybe this is the beginning of the end, you know? And again, this, uh, this, I think this applies to all sorts of creative people, you know, actors and actresses, I'm sure deal with this a lot. Anything that you audition for and have developed as an artistic skill and you win auditions, you lose auditions, you're made promises, Sometimes they're not kept, or not even promises, but just very strongly worded def definitive statements about your involvement in upcoming work or whatever, and it doesn't come through, you know? This can, this can really add to this internal turmoil. So, I want to talk about a few things, two things, that you can do to combat, to fight off this imposter syndrome, this feeling this inner turmoil, um, the not being sure of your place in what you're involved in. Uh, the first thing that you need to do, divorce your sense of self-worth from your musicianship, from your playing. That's hard to do. Um, early on in my session career, I would play something, and sometimes I would, I've talked about this on the channel before, I would get feedback that wasn't great, you know? Somebody would say, uh, I don't know. And <laughs> meanwhile, I'm out on the tracking room floor and I'm like, I just played what I thought was the most amazing thing and it, now it feels like you're rejecting me as a person. They never are, really. Um, especially when you're dealing with producers and artists and songwriters, they're just trying to get to what they hear in their head. And maybe your first try didn't quite get them there, but then they communicate and you try again. And hopefully through that communicating and trying again, you, you sort of narrow in and you get to what it is they're trying to get to. So one of the ways that you can approach that sort of situation rather than freaking out internally and clamming up and like, well, I don't know what to do now, you just rejected me. Um, realize that you're on the hunt together. Okay, and I think this applies for actors as well. Like you and the director are trying to get to the the thing together, right? Well, on on a session, you and the producer are trying to get to the part together. You don't need to save the day on your first attempt, and if you don't save the day on your first attempt. It's some big rejection. You don't need to think like that. You need to understand that you are here to be an artist, but you're also here to do a job. You're also kind of a plumber. You're also in the service industry. You showed up with a truck or a van or a, an amp rack and a guitar vault full of tools, and you're coming in to do the job, right? You're going to fix the toilet. And maybe the first tool you pull out isn't the right one. Or maybe you misdiagnose the problem. But as you attack it, you get closer to figuring out what it is. That's the biggest thing in all of this. That's the biggest thing in life. Not being afraid of trying is the secret. That's it. I've fixed our dryer three times. My wife is not happy about that. She wants a new washer and dryer. <laughs> I keep fixing them. Uh, but, you know, I just, I just, I, I've never opened up a dryer before, but I looked up the symptoms. It just wasn't heating. Everything was spinning. There's just no heat. So somewhere along the line, the dryer isn't sending heat. Either the heating element is broken or the solenoid that turns it on is messed up and, and doesn't work or something. So I took a dryer apart, our dryer. I took it apart, bought both parts that I thought it could be. The total of those parts was like 80 bucks. That's a lot cheaper than a new dryer. And I fixed it and I put it back together. And 
just like there's two ways to approach that situation. One is, all right, let's take it apart and see what we've got. The other is, I'm not a dryer technician. I have no idea what to do. That's true. <laughs> but the reason I say that this is like the biggest secret out there, not being afraid to try, is because when you start taking something apart, your brain starts to understand things about it and how it goes together. When I put it back together, it was like, oh, okay, I remember this piece goes here. Or I'd, I'd consult the YouTube video um, to double check, right? You learn as you take something apart. And in the same way in music, you learn as you make attempts. You learn what the artist wants. You learn what the producer wants. You learn what the song needs. So, um, getting out of your own way is key and understanding that you are on the hunt together and not taking things personally. And that's, that's something that has been massive for me. I feel like right now, if I were to have one of these situations where somebody, somebody was to say like, oh no, why would you play that? Or that's stupid. Or what? A, don't play that. That sounds like a cliche or something. Anything, any response that could be taken the wrong way. I feel like now it would just like ting, <laughs> just ping, <laughs> just bounce right off of me. Because I don't place my self-worth in the way people react to my guitar playing. And if somebody went like overboard and got really weird... First of all, that says a lot more about them than it says about me. Uh, secondly, I would probably kind of look around at the other people in the room and like, is this weird to any of y'all? Or I'd look for, okay, so maybe there's a hidden camera here somewhere. And they're judging my reaction. And if I don't blow my top, I get a hundred bucks or something. You know, one of those, I don't know. I feel like there's shows that do that kind of stuff. They, they mess with people and film how they how they react. There, there was one guy, I think he was a TikToker. He would go find people with wired uh, Apple earbuds, right? They're easy to see. They're like bright white. And he would just go up to them with scissors and shh, cut their, their earbuds, cut the wires. And they'd freak out. And he's like, hey, man, what, why are you freaking out? And he'd film them and everything. Infuriating, right? But at the end of it, he'd give them, what are they called? The eye, these things, AirPods. That's what I'm looking for, AirPod Pros. He'd give them a set of those and they'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> but golly, the adrenaline dump and all the anger and everything, like they're gonna be decompressing from that for a while and it's all for clicks. Whew. Uh, so the more egregious someone gets on a session with a reaction to what I do, at this point, I would just kind of laugh and be like, is this one of those situations? <laughs> the second thing that you can do, and this is huge as well, practice. Practice cures self-doubt. Effective practice. It really does. If you work really hard at being a good musician, and that means transcribing records. And by transcribing, I mean learning the whole thing. I did my own Nashville version of transcribing. I would write number charts for an entire record and I would learn every single guitar part on it by ear. Your ear is greater than any tab. Um, learning stuff by tab, I kind of feel like you're reading it and it becomes this really literal thing. And so you read what's on the page and you don't rely on your ear and you don't get inside the actual phrasing and voicing and inflection and attack of, that's in both hands of the player who played the part you're trying to learn. If you just do it by ear, I know it's harder. Um, I think you'll get farther or further rather. All that to say, the better you view yourself, the more 
stuff will bounce off of you that could be taken the wrong way, the less prone you will be to taking things the wrong way, you know? And I think it comes down to hours and hours and hours of practice. I've talked about that on this channel a lot too. Practice and progress through practice looks like frustration for a very long time. It's like you're pushing against this giant rock and you try to move it so many times and you're exhausted after a day and then you come back and you push against this rock again and nothing happens. And then on the third day, you push it again and just when you're about to give up, it moves like two inches. And you're like, oh my goodness, progress. That's what I think progress at a craft looks like. It's a lot of not progress followed by a little bit of progress and that pattern repeated. And, you know, I've talked about natural ability versus talent and all this stuff. I think at some point the talent runs out for everyone. You will hit a wall on your pure talent and that wall comes pretty early um, for the overwhelming majority of people. I'm not making total blanket statements. I understand there are outliers, just like there are outliers in terms of intelligence level. Um, but for all of us mere mortals, <laughs> successful practice looks like staying the course even when it seems like nothing's happening. And then things start to happen. And then sometimes they accelerate. Sometimes you come back to that rock and you've moved it like three feet and you're like, whoa, that's crazy. I couldn't do that yesterday. It's today I can, yesterday I could not. And then you get to a point where you can't move it again. <laughs> like there's, there's, a, there's a little rise in the ground or something. You, you plateau, you know, but sticking through it and being committed is what it is. You know, that's the deal. So to me, the, in summary, there are two things that you can do to fight this imposter syndrome feeling. One of them is to separate your sense of self-worth and your identity from your playing or from your writing or your musicianship. Um, and the second thing is practice, like just get so much better at your craft. Get to the point where you're so secure in what you can do that someone could have a completely terrible reaction to what you do and it just bounces off of you. And again, those situations say a lot more about that person than they do about you. So I will talk to you guys later. Have a good one.